All right, so if I can find some space up here. Well, like the only things that I want to mention really is not a lot from the chemistry stuff. This is, of course, of course, I'm going to remind you guys about pH. I'm not going to go back over the concept of it. Hopefully, by now, you guys have an idea of how that works and why the 14 is the 14 and the 0 is the 0. And the 7, the reason that the 7 is right smack in the middle way that it works when it does, when you look at H2O, which is you know, obviously water, you look at the structure of it, and we have the oxygen with two hydrogens, right? Well, it can dissociate because of its polarity, that negative of the oxygen can actually steal away that electron. So that would leave that OH group, what we call a hydroxyl group, hanging out on its own. And that would leave the other hydrogen that we stole that electron from, that's the hydrogen ion. So when we measure pH, we're measuring the concentration of that. So the reason that water is neutral is because when you look at the pH of water, it should be this is equal to that, right? Does that make sense? Because you would have H2O, and if you're going to break that up, you know, so this has the uh, positive, and has the negatives, it should be equal when you break that up. So anytime you have a shift one way or the other, that's where we're talking about the change in the pH, right? So you have more hydrogen ions, that's going to be acid, less is going to be base. Okay, so we'll just leave that there. I'm not going to go over the math of it again. I think you guys are starting to get it anyways. But um, uh, the other thing was like the macromolecules, because we're going to be talking about a lot of them like pretty much continuously. The big main idea concepts of the macromolecules, I know you guys are probably completely familiar with. It's not any big old deal, right? So um, we remember that we had, this is just annoying to me. <laughs> I'm not allowed to erase it because it's not mine. If you guys know Dr. Shearer, he doesn't let you erase his boards. But anyway, <laughs> um, we know that we had four macromolecules that we talked about, right? The carbohydrates, which is sugar based, right? That's like our monomer are the monosaccharides, which is just sugar, right? Um, and then we had the lipids. So this is our fatty acids, our uh, hydrophobic you know, hydrocarbon tails, right? So that's the big aspect of what we have going on with those. Um, so, uh, and then we also remember that we have the phospholipids lumped into that category. The phospholipids are a big deal because they are the term for that. Do you guys remember the term for what's going on with the phospholipids? What we would call that? Amphi? Amphipathic. Amphipathic, exactly. So that's gonna be amphipathic because it has that charged head and the hydrocarbon tail, right? So that's the idea with that one. Um, so that's what's important with those two. Then we have the proteins. All right, what's the monomer for this one? You guys remember this one, right? What are they made out of? It's not a trick question. What are proteins made out of? What are the units? Amino acids, right? This isn't tricky here. So um, then we have nucleic acids here. I do want to remind you guys that the monomer unit for the nucleic acid is going to be the nucleotide, right? Nucleotide is going to be that pentose sugar, whether it's ribose or deoxyribose. It's going to be a phosphate group, and it's going to be a nitrogenous base, whether that's A, T, C, or G for DNA, or A, U, C, G for RNA, okay? And do you guys remember what the molecule was that falls into the nucleic acid category that provides our cells with energy? Do you guys remember what that is? ATP, excellent. So that's going to be coming up later as well. So I just did want to touch on that stuff, remind you guys about it, um, keep it fresh in our memories, because some of this stuff is going to matter here. Just a little bit more. So today we're going to be getting into chapter four. Chapter four is going to be going over uh, bacteria and archaea. Um, when we talked in chapter chapters one and three, right, because I would lump those together, but chapter one, we introduced this concept of basically what, how to, how to categorize our microorganisms, right? So this is going to be, again, not a very difficult concept to grasp, but we have the ones that are acellular. What's an example of that? Once no, no cell, they don't have any cells. Anybody have an example of any kind? Viruses, right? Viruses and prions. We're going to talk about viruses the most later, okay? Then we have the ones that are made of cells. We can break that up, whether they have a nucleus or not. 
All right, nucleus, the term for those, eukaryotes, right? Eu means true, karyo is talking about the nucleus. But today we're gonna to be talking about these guys. And they just got a new name uh, not too long ago. Um, we call them the A karyotes now. So A is without, and karyo is nucleus. So the A karyotes. So today, bacteria and archaea are going to be falling into that category, the A karyote category. Now, if it doesn't have a nucleus, a nucleus is just a membrane bound area where we're containing our genetic information. So if we don't have a nucleus, um, we're not going to have any other membrane bound organelles either. We're not going to have mitochondria or endoplasmic reticulum or anything like that. Basically, everything going on inside of bacteria and archaea is kind of just sloshing around inside of the cell. Um, they have areas where things will happen, but it's not contained by a membrane. So that's an important difference that's going on between the eukaryotes and the akaryotes. All right, we already talked about this. This is a pretty good figure when you guys are going back to study. I'm not going to go over this right now. Obviously, it would be hard to because you can't see it very well on this projector screen. But it's a pretty good um, one to come back to when you guys are looking for, OK, what is a fimbria? You can find it up here on here, and it tells you what it is, what it does, and where it is on the organism. When you guys are going back to study, this is pretty good. Pretty good one. Um, so they're true cells, bacteria are. Um, just because they don't have membrane-bound organelles doesn't mean they're not cells. So they can multiply. They can reproduce themselves. Um, they have metabolism. They make ATP as their energy source, just like we would. And then we have nutrient processing. They have nutrient processing for building the cells up as well as making the energy, which we already talked about. They can also uh, work together as a group. We know that our cells can work together as a group in a pretty tight-knit little group, right? Um, we call those organs. So they'd be separated quite differently by tissue than what type of uh, work that tissue does. Um, with bacteria, though, they're not going to create any true tissue, but they can work together in an area, whether it's a colony where we have the one cell that multiplied into a big old mound of cells, or biofilms, which is probably the more important thing for you guys as we're going into um, talking about stuff for diseases, relating back to healthcare and everything like that. So biofilms, uh, a good, probably the most common example of a biofilm that you're going to find out there is going to be plaque on your teeth, right? Um, that's why you're supposed to go to the dentist and get it cleaned off. Brushing will help disrupt the biofilm. Um, flossing will get in between the teeth and disrupt the biofilm between your teeth. That's why you're supposed to floss. Um, and, and so even though it's a pain, that's the only way you're going to be able to disrupt that biofilm. What happens is if you don't disrupt it, your body will start reacting to it like those are invaders. And you start having inflammation. And you start reacting to it as though it's inflammation to try to get rid of it. And then you have... Um, the gums becoming irritated, detaching from the teeth, and you start losing uh, bone as well as that continues on if it's not treated soon. So it actually can be a pretty serious thing. It's not only about cavities and getting fillings. fillings. It can be um, losing your teeth and stuff like that as a result of that. Um, it seems to be that some people who have certain organisms in their biome, in their mouth, are more likely to have dental caries or, or tooth decay. So it's pretty interesting stuff. All right. This is one that's going to come up on most of your tests, like all the time, for, forever, okay? So these are these terms dealing with the shapes. And then right after this, we're going to talk about the arrangements of the bacteria. Some of these will stick in your mind pretty easily, and some of these you're going to need reminding about. That's what I'm here for. So uh, the shapes of the bacteria. This is talking about the shapes of the cells themselves, okay? So caucus. Here, caucus is uh, the spheres. The two biggies that you're going to want to know are caucus and bacillus. There are other ones, and we're going to talk about them, but the two biggies that you really need to know, caucus and bacillus. These are the ones that you're going to see in the lab the most as well. And you have to know this stuff in the lab, too. You're going to have to look at cells in a microscope and tell me if they're a caucus or a bacillus or whatever. So be aware of that. Caucus, they are spheres. Just think of it as round circles. Okay. Bacillus. It says blocky, spindle shaped, and whatever, drum drumstick. Basically, bacilli are going to be rods and variations on the rod, okay? So, bacilli, rods, cocci, spheres. 
Those are the two biggies that I want you to definitely be aware of. Will be on the first test. Um, definitely will be on the lab tests on both of them. Okay. Um, and then, so those are the biggies. Then we have things that where you might be curved. And we have lots of different words for that. Vibrio is like a comma shaped and then all sorts of different spiral types. I'm not as concerned about you guys being, um, you know, really familiar with that since we're going to be seeing mostly the first two. And then there's this term pleomorphism. That just means it doesn't have any defined shape. It could be kind of willy nilly, whatever. That organism doesn't have a defined shape. So here's a pretty good picture where we can see the shapes of the cells as well as actually the arrangements in this image. So this first image up here, this is Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus has its shape in its name already, right? Coccus. So we know already just by its name that it's gonna have round cells. It's a pretty easy one. Um, you can look down be right below it. You can see those cells are also round. They're just linked together differently. We're gonna talk about those arrangements next, but um, that's streptococcus. So that's also going to make sense, right? <laughs> so caucus are round, and then our rods in the middle, um, you can see that they are clearly like long rods, and sometimes they can stick together by their ends, sometimes they'll stick next to each other, sometimes they don't really have a true arrangement. It just kind of depends. Um, yeah, and then the curved ones, which, yeah, they just look cool. All right, so those are the shapes of the cells. Cocci and bacilli are your biggies. The way that the cells can be arranged can also define what you might see in you know, a particular species of bacteria. So diplococci speaks for itself too. Tetrads, tetra four, right? So already this is pretty easy, but the ones that kind of trip people up, staphylo and strepto. Staphylo, irregular clusters, strepto, we have chains. Now, here's how I remember this, and you guys do what you need to do in order to remember it. But when I know that I need to know the difference between staphylo and strepto, let's say those are your two choices. There's not another one that's going to be a similar word that you're going to see in this context, right? So staphylo or strepto, you can't remember which one is which. To me, strepto sounds like strip, and strip is like a chain, okay? That's how I remember it, um, whatever works for you. Staphylo means like grape, like clusters for what it's worth. So when we come back to this image we were just looking at, the top one with the arrow, Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylo, irregular clusters. You can see that in the image. Um, coccus, round cells. So when you look at streptococcus, um, strip, chain, right? So chains of cells that are round coccus. So we already know a lot about the shape of the cells as well as the arrangement of the cells when we were to look at them under a microscope, right? So that, so that they have them in their names. Now, that's nice for us <laughs> in this particular circumstance, but they don't always have that in their names, right? If we talk about Escherichia coli, I mean, what are you getting out of that? Not a whole lot, except some old guy's name probably slapped on to the beginning of it. So not all of them are gonna be giveaways like that. But um, if I were to put on a test, let's say Staphylococcus aureus, um, what could you tell me about the shape and the arrangement. Well, you know the answer now. Staphylo, irregular bunches, and then caucus, that's gonna be the round cells. Okay, hope you break it down a little bit. And we also have this arrangement called sarcina. It's just like cubic arrangements, okay? Um, bacilli can have another kind of arrangement. They can have something called palisades. Palisades is like a word for like fencing, basically, or um, something like a divider. So they, that's really essentially when you look at it, it looks like they're just up next to each other like um, this way, like vertically. Instead of like end to end, now they're like side to side. That's really what that means. Um, that has to do with how they divide and stick to one another when they are forming new cells. But palisades, they look like a fence. Take a fence, okay? Um, and the spirals often stick like, well, they'll stick end to end if they, if they do have um, some sort of arrangement. So moving on, the biofilms. Um, bacteria will often cooperate one with one another. Whether we're, whether we're coming along as bacteria under your teeth, right? You have some rough spot on your teeth, they'll kind of stick there and start growing there. Um, that, that makes sense because they want to have a little hideout place to collect food from in your mouth and whatever. But other bacteria can come along and stick with them and then so on and so forth, building up layer upon layer upon layer of all this bacteria. 
the coolest part about biofilms isn't even the fact that they can exist. It's the fact that the, the bacteria that are within the biofilms can actually communicate with one another. They have the ability to send out chemical signals saying like, oh, there's danger toxin or there's not enough food or stuff like that to tell the biofilm, oh, hey, maybe you want to break up, maybe not be a biofilm anymore, or be like, hey, there's tons of food, happy times, let's hang out here a little bit longer and even build larger. So um, they're obviously not doing this consciously, it's just a product of their own reaction to their environment, but it works um, to the advantage of the entire biofilm. They call that quorum sensing, and we'll learn more about that later. But yes, so it's pretty beneficial to the microbes that are able to join in on this good old fun. And we'll see here in the image that it's showing of the bacteria forming the biofilm, we have something called a glycocalyx, which we're gonna get into, no worries. Um, but glyco, that sounds like what to you guys, what kind of macromolecule would glyco fall into? Sugar, right? It's a sugar-based compound, so carb. So sugars are pretty sticky, yeah? Um, so it makes sense that we've got the sticky layer that can be on the outside of the cells that can help them. Um, so that's basically how that whole thing can operate is, is because of that stickiness on the outside of some of these cells. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so uh, bacteria can move around. They have the ability to be modal. They can move from one area to another. It's particularly useful if you are living in areas like the gut or something like that, where you want to uh, move around within that gut and do your damage or whatever <laughs> appropriately. So um, uh, you'll find actually that a lot more bacteria that we will see in the lab will have the ability to move than won't actually. Um, so that's, it's not uncommon. That's what I want to say. It's not an uncommon uh, characteristic to have. Flagella and axial filaments are the things that allow the cells to move. The one that I am more concerned about you guys knowing, and it's on your study sheets, is going to be that flagella. And we're going to talk about the flagella and how it works for the bacteria for motility here in a moment, because it's pretty neat. Uh, but if you're just trying to attach to things, fimbriae, and pili and something called nanowires. Um, they're gonna allow for attachment points or creation of channels between the cells, but they are not involved in motility. Only really the flagella for our purposes, okay? All right, so here's an image of like cartoon, I guess you could say, of the flagella. Now, when you look at this, it looks quite a lot like a motor, right? It looks like a motor and it looks like that as well if we were to look at this using an electron microscope. It really actually looks like that. And the uh, filament of the flagella, which is like that long hair-like appendage that allows it to move, it turns, it rotates. And that's how the bacteria will move. Not whip-like motion, eukaryotes will do that. But our akaryotes, our bacteria are going to be doing um, the rotating with this motor-like apparatus. Super neat. Um, we can have flagella basically arranged around the cell in a whole bunch of different ways. And we have to have terms for it, of course, because this is science and we like our terms. So uh, we'll go through these. If you are talking about flagella that are associated at one end or both ends, so one end, the other, or both ends, that's polar. Okay. <laughs> so you have to think of poles of the cell, right? Polar arrangements. Sometimes you don't have polar arrangements. If you are, let's go down to the bottom one, okay? If you are peritrichus, trike is talking about hair because the flagella looks quite a lot like hairs. Um, that means the flagella are all over your surface. Well, that's not polar, right? So that's just gonna be all over the place. So that one is not polar, but the other ones can be polar. So monotrichus, you have one flagellum, it has to be at one pole or the other. This first image that we're looking at is a really long flagellum on this particular bacterium, but you can see it sticking out like that. It is monotrichus, one flagella. All right, uh, lophotrichus will have tufts. This is this image here that we can see in C. Um, e. coli is pretty famous for this one, having a big old tuft on its butt, if you will. Uh, it's just a whole little bunch of them stuck on one end of the cell, so lofo. I don't know, lofo sounds like a word to me that sounds feels like it would be tuft-like, <laughs> but <laughs> you do you. Do you. Um, amphi, we already know what amphi means, right? It's going to be at both. So now we're going to have flagella at both ends of the cell. Anytime you see them at both ends, amphitrichus. All right. So those are our four different arrangements that you can have associated with your flagella. 
can see then this image down here, this is a pretty good example of the peritrichus and covered with it all over the surface. This one will be on the exam for sure. Okay. Chemotaxis and phototaxis. Now that we've learned that we can move as uh, using our flagella, right? And only the flagella really is what we're interested in. Your fimbriae, no, right? That's not involved with that. And uh, your pili, no, that's not involved with moving. So you're using your flagella to get around. And how do you decide where you're going to want to go? Um, that's going to be responding to the stimuli around you. So whatever your chemical milieu is around your cell. Do you want to go towards a thing or away from a thing? If you were standing in here and I were to put at one end of the room uh, new, new baked cookies and at the other end of the room really rotten garbage, right? That's you smelling those things and probably wanting to move towards the cookies as a response to that. They do a similar thing. They're picking up on chemical signals around them. So they're gonna wanna move towards the cookies or away from the garbage, especially if they were to see the garbage as harmful, not just gross. Um, so that would be positive for the cookies, moving towards the thing. Negative chemotaxis, moving away from the thing, okay? Typically, negative is going to be away from a toxin or something else harmful. All right, and then we have phototaxis. I feel like that kind of speaks for itself. You're moving towards the light. If you're a bacteria that is photosynthetic, you use light to help you make energy, then you want to move towards the light. So you can be sensitive to them. So that's chemotaxis and phototaxis. Chemo, again, chemical response here. Taxis, like a taxi, you're moving around. The way that bacteria accomplish this using their flagella is going to be the runs and the tumbles. So they can't necessarily direct this super precisely, the way that we can very precisely walk in a direction. They can only move their flagella in clockwise or counterclockwise. That's all they can do. So how, did this, how does that help them? They can't turn it, really. How does that help them get from one place to the other? Well, what they will do is when they're spinning in one direction, that'll help them go straight. That's a one, okay? Um, if they turn it suddenly in the other direction, that's gonna cause a tumble because suddenly we turned in another direction. So that's how that's gonna help drive it. So they can't necessarily pick as specifically as we would when we're turning, but if they tumble enough in this process, they'll get away from something, yes. That is a good question. They can control the motors, like the, the motors can be individually controlled for some bacteria, um, just because it's how they would be delivering that energy to like each motor, you know, um, since they are kind of fueled individually, if you will. So they can, um, but again, so it's still not gonna be super precise, right? <laughs> um, and they would want to probably move them together just at the same time in general, uh, just in order to give you the best advantage for moving. But yeah, the motors can be powered individually. That makes sense. Okay. So um, we can see here, like if we're doing a whole bunch of tumbles, uh, we're not making any sort of general progress here, um, but you might have, if you're doing a tumble and you're going in the right direction, you might run in that direction until you think you need to do another tumble if you are moving with purpose. So that's the idea. If there's a chemical signal of some kind to move towards something or away from something, then you may or may not tumble based on if you still smell the thing, right? So that's essentially how they will control their movements. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, just so that we're aware, the axial filament is sort of like if you had a flagella inside of the cell and it'll twist, like if you have a spring, right? You take a spring and you twist that spring and it gets super, super tight. And then, you know, it would be more springy then as a result. That's how the axial filaments can work in our spiral shaped cells. So that we're aware that's how that works. All right, moving on to the things that are not involved in motility. Here we have things that are involved in attachment primarily, as well as forming channels between the cells. So the, the pilus or the pili, um, they are involved in adhesion to surfaces, but those guys also very, very importantly are gonna be involved in forming channels between cells. 
Why would this matter? Well, it matters because we are going to be able to transfer genetic information across those channels. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to get a little more detail about that, uh, but it is called conjugation. So you can understand how, you know, sharing genetic information, how that could be called conjugation. But um, they can also be involved in adhesion. Fimbriae are our more common, what we would think of adhesion type of um, appendages, if you will. So uh, we'll get into those. So the fimbriae, they look like tiny bristle-like things on the surface of the cell, little tiny hairs, not long snake-like hairs like we saw with the flagella, tiny little ones on the outside. Uh, they're mostly gonna be made of protein and stick to other surfaces. They can also stick to um, you know, other cells and help in the creation of biofilms because of the ability to adhere. Uh, this is how E. coli will adhere to epithelial cells. This is pretty important, especially if we were talking about the kind of E. coli that can cause urinary tract infections. Now, we're going to get into this more when we get into the disease chapters, but um, most, close to 80% of all urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli, caused by E. coli from your own body, right? So there's just traveling from where it is and it should be into where it shouldn't be. And um, the ability of E. coli to adhere into your bladder, a place where it shouldn't be able to do, where we have a lot of flushing now and flushing motion, will flush out bacteria too, is due to things like this, the fimbriae here. So that will allow them to adhere better in that sort of situation, makes them more pathogenic. So pathogenic meaning causing disease for us. Anytime that we have something that helps the organism cause disease, we would call that a virulence factor. Don't worry, we'll talk about it a lot. All right, onto the pili, they're made of a pillin protein. That's cool. Conjugation is um, when they create the tunnel between cells so they can transfer DNA. A lot of times we're talking about little bits of DNA or um, small circular DNA called plasmids. Another thing we're gonna get into. For the outside of the cell, we've been talking kind of about the outside of the cell with our fimbriae and our uh, flagella, but now the actual coatings on the cell, possibil possibilities of coatings. Um, S layer, this is just protein layer on the outside and it's only gonna produce that in a hostile environment. The bigger one that I want you to be aware of, the glycocalyx, that's the glyco, we said already, it's that sugar coating. So there's sticky coating. It comes in two forms, the slime layer and the capsule. Right? So slime layer, slimy, it's gonna be kind of loosely associated around the cell. And uh, it's mostly just gonna be protective for those cells and environments. Whereas the capsule, it's going to be more dense, more tightly associated with the cell. And its primary function, really, I mean, for most pathogenic bacteria anyways, is going to be helping those bacteria evade phagocytosis. Now, there's an image of that, by the way, so we can just see the difference of how you can picture it. Um, and we'll talk about the capsule stain, but it doesn't, the capsule itself doesn't stain, so you can see the background and the cells. Yes, what's up? Mm -hmm. So they can both do um, surfaces and other bacteria, um, but the difference is that the pillars can create those channels. The fimbria can't create the channels. The transfer of DNA or whatever, yeah. Yeah, you can see here on the growth of this plate without the capsule versus with the capsule. Capsule, it looks slimier. It's already showing just in the growth of it. So cool. So the capsules, those sticky coating, those densely associated sticky coatings, I said that they protect against phagocytosis. So what does that mean? Our white cells, and something that we're going to learn about in unit three, our immune system, our white cells, have the ability to eat up foreign invaders, okay? That's called phagocytosis. Phago meaning eating, cytosis, the cell is doing the eating. So uh, these are cells that go around eating up bad guys. And when they have a sticky coating like this, it can be very difficult for our phagocytes that are doing this, our immune cells, to get a grip on the bacteria essentially and associate with them. We have ways to get around that, but at face value, it makes it difficult for our phagocytes to eat them up. 
Um, yeah. Uh, another good example besides plaque on your teeth uh, for the biofilms, which is going to be uh, really closely associated with our fimbria for sticking to surfaces, as well as our um, capsules being sticky and sticking to surfaces. Uh, we have, they say, long-term indwelling artificial advice, uh, devices. That could be something like a knee, replaced knee or replaced hip, or it could be pacemakers and stuff like that. Um, things that are more likely to get, need to get changed out, like the pacemaker, are more at risk. The more you expose it to the environment, the more likely you are to get bacteria on it. And that's why a lot of times whenever you have people who are needing hip replacements or knee replacements, they will put them on antibiotics before the surgery to just get their system already pumping those antibiotics to prevent the formation of biofilms um, once they get the artificial thing into them, artificial joint. All right, moving in even further, we have the cell envelope. This is a big idea term, okay? It's gonna have parts that you're gonna have to be familiar with. We have the cell wall, the cytoplasmic membrane and the outer membrane for some of them. Now, all of them have a cytoplasmic membrane. Cytoplasmic membrane is just a membrane that contains the junk inside the cell. Everything has to be contained somehow. That's what makes it a cell. So um, that's the cytoplasmic membrane. So they all always have that. Cell wall, it's pretty characteristic uh, feature of a lot of these bacteria. There are some bacteria that don't have cell walls though. And then the outer membrane, it says in some bacteria, this typically outer membrane is gonna be associated with the gram negative bacteria. All right, and it works together. That whole thing is the cell envelope. So I keep talking to you guys about gram positive, gram negative. This is the chapter where we're finally gonna get into what that means. Maybe unfortunately for you guys, now you have to know it. But um, we have a stain that's developed by this guy, Hans Christian Graham, um, to just tell the difference between gram positive and gram negative. And they're literally labeled as gram positive or gram negative based on how they stain with this stain, okay? Uh, gram positive bacteria, they tend to have a thick cell wall very thick wall. And that cell wall is made of peptidoglycan. So we already talked about gly glyco, like the glycocalyx, right? Glycan also, it's gonna be what kind of molecule? Sugar, exactly. It's a sugar base. Um, and then peptido, peptide. So what are peptides made out of? Protein. Yeah, well, so yeah, protein. So um, protein will be made out of amino acids and as will peptides, so shorter units than a whole protein would be. So peptides, so uh, we think of peptide bonds maybe when we're putting our amino acids together, right? I'm sure that we all remember this quite fondly. Uh, but yeah, so they obviously have an inner cytoplasmic membrane because they all have to have that. The gram negatives though, they have that thin cell wall. That's the important, important difference here. Thick cell wall for the gram positives, gram negative, they are, have a thin cell wall. And then because they have that thin cell wall, they have an outer membrane to help with protection and maintaining the shape of the cells. Uh, it just needs that extra help because the cell wall isn't there to kind of stabilize the shape of the organism. And that's the difference between these organisms, really, gram positive and gram negative. We have all sorts of variations on a theme as we get out of that. But here's an image looking at this. Very thick layer of peptidoglycan in this purple here. That's our gram positive. And then our peptidoglycan layer down here in our gram negative. 10 times or more uh, less thick. So very thin comparatively speaking. Because the cell wall of our gram positive bacteria is gonna be so thick, it needs help kind of maintaining itself, especially whenever we're making new cells. And that's where these molecules, lipotechoic and tachoic acid come into play. They're involved in maintaining the structure of the cell wall, especially during cell division. So that's associated with gram positives. So if I ask you guys, oh, you know, you had a patient and we did a test and we found tachoic acid in it. What type of bacteria is this? You would be able to tell me that it is at least a gram positive. Can't be gram negative if it's got that going on, okay? All right, gram negatives though, they've got that thin cell wall, but they have that outer membrane now. So that's a little extra feature that the gram positives don't have. So the outer membrane is going to be studded with lipoproteins, 
And they sort of tell you kind of what they are. So proteins associated with lipids. Um, as well as lipopolysaccharides. Now that, that's the big one that I want you to be aware of. Their outer membrane, special because it's studded with lipopolysaccharides. The particular lipopolysaccharide that I'm referring to, we just call it LPS for lipopolysaccharide, but it is also known um, as endotoxin. So if I ever talk about endotoxin being found, you guys would know immediately that's a gram negative organism, it has to be, just like tocolic acid is the gram positive. Um, endotoxin, the reason it's called that, it is a toxin to your body, to my body, to our bodies. Um, or the way that we're going to be responding to it, your immune system basically attacks it like it is a toxin and it can affect you, cause a shock and stuff like that. It also causes fever and, and all this. So that is kind of why gram negatives can be so dangerous if you do get an illness with them in your bloodstream. A lot of the times the gram negatives that we encounter in our lives are gonna be enteric, which means they're in your gut. So they should stay there is basically what I'm saying. Um, if they make their way out of that environment, then that's when it causes problems. But, that, but this is why, the endotoxin. Endo means inside, right? Endo means inside. So endo, because it's part of the cell itself. It's not secreting this toxin. It's actually part of the cell. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. We already talked about peptidoglycan. So peptidoglycan is actually kind of cool. It, it has these repeating sugar units, and that's what these little hexagons are down here, repeating. And then they're linked together by the peptides, like a bridge between them. And essentially, you're building a scaffolding out of that. And it works quite effectively as that, exactly. Um, so it looks quite a lot like a scaffolding to build up those thick cell walls. Um, so it's cool stuff. All right. Uh, yeah, we were talking about this. So yeah, we see that it's 20 to 80 nanometers for the gram positive cell wall. The ne gram negative cell wall is going to be uh, one to three nanometers. They're both peptidoglycan. It's just one is way thicker than the other. All righty. Uh, because the cell wall is thicker on the gram positives, they're going to be more protected from bursting open in environments where you know you might burst open um, in low tonicity situations and stuff like that. So osmolarity. Um, all right, so that's the idea of the cell wall, kind of got into the concept of that. There are some bacteria that are going to deviate, and that's what we're getting into next. The two bacteria that we're really going to be talking about that I feel like are important to get from the next couple of slides and to know the difference, really, okay? Mycobacterium and mycoplasma. You understand now how you could get these confused. Pretty easy. Okay, so mycolic acid. Mycolic acid, myco, okay, is a wax, a waxy substance that is found on the surface of mycobacterium cells. So mycolic acid. So I'm just going to look at that one over here. And that's hard to see. I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't have a whole lot of room. Um, mycolic acid which is like a wax. So it's on the outside of the gram positive uh, wall and it's just gonna help protect it even more. So this is a special coating that we see associated with uh, bacteria, mycobacterium, bacteria, go figure. But here we're talking about mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium leprae. Those guys are what you guys might be concerned with as far as pathogens go, those are the biggies. So tuberculosis and leprosy. It also mentions no cardia. I'm never gonna test you over that because it's not a medically important. Okay. Mycobacterium, though, we already know that that's medically important. Yeah, since a third of the world has tuberculosis. So mycobacterium, mycolic acid. We have a special stain that associates with that wax um, that allows us to stain these. It's an acid based stain. And if you rinse with acid and it stays on there, then it means that there's mycolic acid. We're gonna do it eventually in lab and it'll make more sense, but that's the acid fast stain. It is definitely one of like the bread and butters as far as diagnosing things like tuberculosis. Yeah, you can get a chest X-ray and um, all that, but you, you can't, if you come into someone's hospital and you're coughing and they wanna test you for tuberculosis, they can't do the skin test on you because that's gonna take days. 
It's ridiculous. Plus, it's not entirely reliable. So they'll do a chest X-ray and it will show something in there, but does that tell them that it is necessarily tuberculosis? Yeah, no, it doesn't. It can be characteristic, but you wanna confirm that. And so what typically will be done, they can do PCR, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with that, testing for the DNA. That's one possibility. The other possibility, even faster than PCR, is the acid fat stain. Have your patient cough into, cough some sputum into a cup, send it to the lab, they can do a stain on the sputum itself and give you an answer within less than an hour. So it's pretty cool stuff. That, that is a very commonly ordered test. When I worked at Integra Southwest, we often got that test order, ordered for um, people who came in like homeless individuals that were having issues. But anyways, so that's, that is mycolic acid mycobacterium. Now, mycoplasmas. So we're talking about these two organisms that their names could be potentially confusing, mycobacterium and mycoplasma, right? So we're talking about bacterium all the time, but when we talk about plasma, I think of plasma as being like when you give blood, right? And that's like the clear portion of your blood, like the liquid portion of your blood. Um, so if I were to take a cup of plasma from your body and just dump it on the floor, would it maintain its shape? No, right? So it has a completely amorphous, no shape to it whatsoever. So that's how I remember that mycoplasmas have no cell wall and therefore they don't have a set shape. They're pleomorphic. So to me, plasma, that's the thing that I focus on when I see that name, not on the myco here. So plasma is the one that's uh, gonna be this, no cell wall, that's its important thing. Mycobacterium, however, mycolic acid, that's gonna be like tuberculosis and stuff, acid fast. Really easy to get those mixed up and you'll probably get them mixed up in the beginning. All right, moving on, talking about the uh, bilayer. You've noticed we haven't talked much about um, archaea because they're just crazy weird. Like they just have a completely different chemistry than bacteria and they're really uncommon as far as pathogens. So our membranes are all selectively permeable. They allow for the transfer of like water basically across the membrane as well as small nonpolar molecules. That's just because of the way that the chemistry of the bilayer is. With those charged heads on the outside and the hydrophobic tails on the inside of the layer, um, that just is weird for things to travel through. So that's basically why. So it's important because now we can keep what's supposed to be in, in, and what's supposed to be out, out. And we have ways, of course, of subverting that system. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about in this chapter. All right, this is talking about lipopolysaccharide for our gram negatives. Uh, I don't really know what else to say about it. It's endotoxin. Porin proteins. So these are proteins that can be uh, used to form pores in the membranes to allow things to go in and out of the membrane. Um, this is really talking mostly about the gram negative outer membrane. Okay. All right, moving on to the gram stain and the concept of how the gram stain works. I'm sure you're like, finally, this is what I've been dreaming of. All right. The first step in the gram stain is going to be crystal violet. This is a purple, obviously it's violet, right? Purple stain. Um, and it's going to get stuck inside of peptidoglycan. It'll stick on pretty much any cell surface, but it really gets stuck in peptidoglycan. Okay? If you're just using gram, uh, crystal violet, it will stain any cell purple. If you're just using that, and that's where you're stopping. So you can use it as a simple dye. However, that's not what this is about, right? So we're going to do crap to your cells to make sure that we're getting um, the answer. Is this gram negative or positive? So we stain first with the crystal violet. And it gets stuck in the peptidoglycan, but not necessarily permanently. Now we add iodine. It is a mordant. That just means it's causing the crystal violet to stick in place, sort of like brick mortar. Okay, so it's causing it to stick in place um, because of how thin the cell wall is in the gram negatives. It doesn't do anything. So it's just now we just have we still have the crystal violet in here, but it's not fixed in place because it wasn't enough to get fixed. Okay. Next, we rinse with alcohol. Alcohol will rinse all of the crystal violet free if it wasn't bound by the iodine, um, but it also breaks apart the, oh, here it is, the membranes, the outer membrane. So it helps even more with rinsing out the crystal violet on the gram negative because it has that outer membrane. Um, that was all that was holding in that crystal violet really. So now we have the weakened outer membrane and we've rinsed out the dye. If you were to look at your cells at this step after doing this, your gram positives would be purple and your gram negatives would be clear, right? Then you're gonna counter stain. 
So that last one that we're going to be doing here, it's called a counter stain because we have a cell now that could potentially be clear. We want to be sure that we give it a chance to be seen. It's really hard to see unstained cells. So we're going to counter stain with another stain because we potentially moved, removed all the dye. Um, so it's red. We call it red dye. Uh, saffron is red dye. That's why I say red for gram negatives. Um, it looks pinkish in the microscope, but it's a red dye. And um, you can't see the red for the purple. That purple is just hella purple. It's purple. So, but it is there, I promise, if you were to be able to parse it out. Um, but all you'll see is purple. However, for the gram negative, you wash out all the purple. So now all you'll see is red or pinkish. So that's how the gram stain will work and how you delineate. That's why positives are purple and negatives are red. Okay. All right, cytoplasm of the cell is just the water-based stuff inside of the cell. We know that um, it's where everything that the cell is needing in order to do anything in the cell, that's where it's gonna be happening, especially for bacteria, they don't compartmentalize. Um, the chromosome of the bacteria, they have a, a single circular strand of DNA. Now we know we have multiple chromosomes, yeah? So we have multiple chromosomes and they're linear. The X's, that's not circles, right? So that's uh, linear chromosomes. So not bacteria though, they have a big giant, just one big giant circular chromosome, basically. And it hangs out in an area of the cell called the nucleoid region. Uh, all right, plasmids, we mentioned this briefly. Tiny little bits of DNA that are non-essential to survival, but can help survival. Um, but you're not gonna die without it. Otherwise it would be part of the genome. Uh, yeah, so little tiny circles of DNA that carry some extra genes that may help the bacteria be more pathogenic or something like that. Okay. A lot of times what I'm talking about with this is like antibiotic resistance genes or toxin production. Um, ribosomes, this is all we already kind of touched on this. The structures that help with creating protein, theirs differ from ours. That's all this is talking about. And I'm not going to ask you guys how much or why or anything, but they differ. And then we have inclusion bodies. It's just storage places inside of the bacterial cells. They can't have a membrane about it, but they can put them in specific locations. Uh, I don't really care too much about the cytoskeleton. It just gives the shape of the cell. All right, moving on to endospores. Endospores, they are special structures that are created by the bacteria to help them withstand hostile environments. Typically, that's going to mean a loss of nutrients, carbon or um, nitrogen, loss of that. Because you absolutely need carbon. All of our molecules in our whole body is, has carbon somewhere in it. They're organic molecules. Um, and then nitrogen is important for your amino acids, amino, right? It's got a, a nitrogen, as well as our, your nitrogenous bases that are part of your DNA and RNA. So you have to have those things. Um, so yeah, let's say you run out of those things. If you are lucky enough to be one of these bacteria that can make endospores and you run out of those nutrients, then you'll make an endospore. All right, so you have two phases of life if you are one of these organisms. You have the vegetative version and the endospore version. Vegetative is just normal, me metabolically active, doing normal things. Um, dividing, making new guys, moving around, everything. The endospore, however, is only going to be um, just protecting the genetic information, basically. So it's dormant. It's completely dormant. Say inert is what this says, resting condition. It's dormant. It's not moving around. It can't move even if it wanted to. It's literally just housing the DNA until we get to a better situation. Okay, so vegetative or endospore for these guys. And of course, we have terms for how you're going to go in between. If you need to form spores, that's sporulation. Okay, going from vegetative to endospore, that's sporulation. Spores are important for the bacteria, it helps them resist heat, drying, freezing, radiation, and chemicals on top of the fact that it helps them um, survive without their nutrients or whatever. So it's really hard to clean them, especially if we're just cleaning them with superficial sort of disinfectants like we do at hospitals. You can't autoclave a whole room. So uh, it can be really difficult to get rid of things like C. diff that form endospores. Alrighty, um, the sporangium is the cell that's making the endospore. So the cell has to make it, and that cell that is making it, sporangium usually takes about six to eight hours to make an endospore or a sporangium to make the endospore. 
This is a good little life cycle picture. It's a pretty good uh, reference point for endospore formation. Um, but anyways, you have your vegetative cell at the top up here, normal cell doing everything it wants. It wants to make endospores because it's running out of food. So it starts. I don't need you to know the steps, but you will notice that, hey, this cell is undergoing steps to make endospores. We have formation of an endospore coating to protect it. And eventually it comes out as an endospore on its own and will just exist by itself. Um, so the free endospore is released. Uh, so that's what will chill. This is what's gonna chill in the soil as tetanus or as um, anthrax, for example. So that's what would be hanging out there. Um, well, so now we've got our situation turned around. Uh, let's say you step on a nail out in your granddad's farm and that endospore that you picked up off from the soil and the nail um, contained an endospore of tetanus, right? Basically, what's gonna be happening is it sees that as an environment where it could potentially live. So it's gonna undergo a process called germination. So now we're gonna turn back into vegetative cells so we can start growing and replicating and everything like that and making the toxin that causes tetanus. Um, luckily, you have been vaccinated, so it will do nothing to you, but that's how that would work. Um, so it's going to germinate and create a new vegetative cell, and then you know you start the cycle again if you want to. It takes about 1.5 hours to germinate to go from an endospore to an actual working bacteria, which is why the powder form of anthrax is so effective. So you just breathe it in a little bit, and suddenly you've got anthrax growing in your lungs within an hour and a half of sniffing up the endospores. Um, but yeah, see if I'm covering all I want to cover. Most or more or less, it needs to be like rehydrated. That's the most important part of it, as well as whatever nutrient it wanted to begin with. All right, so here's some very common diseases. I'm gonna say common, commonly known diseases uh, that we would all recognize for the most part that are caused by bacteria that have endospore production. Uh, Bacillus anthracis, Clostridium tetani. Clostridium perfringens and Clostridium botulinum. Um, and then also we have what, one that I was just talking about, right? C. diff, or it's actually C. difficile. Um, it is Clostridium, it used to be Clostridium, now it's Clostridioides, same thing, okay? So they changed the name, who cares? However, what I wanna point out here, you notice that it's a lot of Clostridium and there's a bacillus here. If it is bacillus, or it is clostridium, it makes endospores. If it makes endospores, it must be bacillus or clostridium, okay? Only but bacillus and clostridium make endospores, and all of those do, okay? Um, on top of that, as far as you're concerned, for the acid fast test and mycolic acid, we were talking about with that wax, right? Mycobacterium, that's the only one you need to know. So there we have a couple of things just to be aware of, just keep stuck in your mind at all times. I'm going to talk about them a lot and you're going to get sick of hearing me say, but um, yeah. Endospores, bacillus and clostridium, acid fast, mycobacterium. Okay. Especially because these are so important for <coughs> medical industry. All right, all right. We already know it's hard to get rid of the endospores and it can be quite uh, difficult to get rid of them in an environment like a hospital. Um, but it's also important for food canning. That's where botulism comes from. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but yeah, if they ever tell you like don't buy cans that like look like they're about to bust or something like that, that's because it could have botulism in there, the air, the air gas that the clostridium makes. Um, but yeah. And that's like hella deadly. Like, I don't want you guys to think that it's like any little, little thing that you're like, no worries. No, it's a really bad disease. Um, that's why people were freaking out so much when Botox started being a big thing because it was just like, you're doing what with what? So, um, because it can, it can be deadly easily. It causes paralysis, obviously. It causes paralysis in your muscles. And if you ingest it, then it causes paralysis in all of your muscles and you will suffocate because you can't move your diaphragm. That's how you die. A lot of diseases like that. That's how tetanus works, except you're just seized up, like the opposite. Um, archaea, they're weird. I don't know, uh, I don't really need you guys to know much about it. I'm sure you noticed that on your study sheet, I don't talk about archaea. Uh, that's the reason. 
but they're weird. They have their own like kinds of lipids and their own cell wall and what it's made of, it's like hydrocarbons and like all this weird stuff. They're strange. They're very strange. And they live in extreme environments, high, high salt, um, heat, acid, all of this stuff. And they also produce methane. They're actually pretty heavy methane producers. We talk about uh, producing methane in swamps and stuff. Uh, that's archaea that does that. And it's actually a big contributor to greenhouse gases. It's just archaea. Not us, we're not doing it. Um, yeah, digestive system of animals. If you are releasing quite a lot of methane from your digestive system, typically it's gonna be associated with archaea. All uh, right, so let's go through some of the terms. Extreme halophiles, halo is like a halogen. I don't have a uh, periodic table in here. So the halogens are gonna be um, things like chlorine and stuff like that. So chlorine, fluoride, that sort of stuff. Iodine. So these guys need salt, basically. So we're talking about chlorine mostly here, halogen, halophiles, salt, all right? They need salt to live. And in fact, they've become so accustomed to having the salt that they can't live in like an environment like we do, or we would consider it to be, you know, osmolarity like to be neutral. They can't live in it because they are kind of dependent on having the salt around. They also create a red pigment. If you guys have ever seen like those really cool pictures of like white lakes or whatever, and it has red all over it, those are not computer generated necessarily. Um, some of them might be, but uh, the archaea are red like that, like almost like blood. And they have that pigment to like photosynthesis, essentially their version of photosynthesis. Pretty cool stuff. I guess they're cool. I just, they're weird. Psychrophiles, this is the term for the guys that grow at this really low temperatures and hyperthermophiles, the really high temperatures. They can live at temperatures above boiling. So like it says here, flourish at temperatures between 80 degrees Celsius and 113 degrees Celsius. In case we haven't forgotten, 100 degrees Celsius is boiling. So they flourish at that temperature. I don't even, Archaea, man, I don't even know. They're not meant to be here, like from a different planet or something. Uh, so yeah. If you're trying to figure out about your bacteria, I'm supposed to teach you guys about Bergie's manual, it's the worst. And um, if you're looking at the actual physical copy anyways, if I had access to the digital copy, it's not too bad. But what used to be with our unknown project, I would have you guys go look up facts about your uh, bacteria in Bergie's manual, but it's like a multi-book thing where like you look up a trait and then it like directs you to a different book and then that directs you to like another book. You guys get the idea. So it's a huge pain in the butt. So I stopped doing that. <laughs> and I just let people Google. Uh, I'm like, as long as your stuff that you're, you know, giving to me is accurate, I don't mind if you Google. But if it's not accurate, then of course you're not gonna be pointed for it. Um, yeah, take that risk. Bergie's manual, it's that manual that's gonna help you figure out what your organism is based on whatever traits you're talking about. Uh, phenotypic traits, anything that's not a genotype. Genotype is literally your genetic makeup. Phenotype is whatever is expressed or portrayed. So Bergie's manual can go off of that or it can go off of uh, ribosomal RNA sequencing. Right. Then we have the taxonomic uh, groupings of our bacteria and archaea as far as their cell wall goes. I don't know why this is a thing, why we group things based on this, but we do. So here's how I remember it, all right? Bear with me. Firm acute, firm. To me, gram positive, they have those thick cell walls. They're firm, okay? That's how I remember firm acutes. So that's where I start. The next place I go is Mendoza acutes. Mendoza is what I think of. Now I'll tell you why. I have, uh, back when I was in eighth grade or some stupid thing, I had this boyfriend. His name was, I was a kid, okay? His name was Joey Mendoza, right? And that was a very long time ago. And so to me, that's archaic, that's old, right? So that's how I remember Mendoza cutes because Joey Mendoza was cute. Um, <laughs> so that's how I remember that that's archaea, okay? And then hopefully that helps you guys too. Then I have two left, right? Gracilla cutes and Tenera cutes. G of those two, G, gram negative. And then Tenera cutes is what's left for the lack of the cell wall. Sometimes if I have a question, like on a test or something, even for me, and I can't remember which one is which, I'll like write out the list and like just put the words in and then like what they are, gram negative, gram positive, no so all and whatever. So I can be like, okay, so this is the term referring to, cause I can't always remember. Um, and then it's stupid because we have bacterial species 
But then within a species, you can have strains. And that just means that, yes, you classify as like E. coli, but because you make all these toxins, technically you're E. coli 0157H7. And this is different from like E. coli in somebody's gut. Um, if you make toxins and stuff like that. So, so the difference is, okay, so salmonella is really nuts as far as that goes. You have salmonella um, enteritidis, which is um, basic, basic salmonella. And that might not even necessarily cause disease in a healthy person, but then you start breaking it down to enterica and enterica does cause disease, causes regular like, salmonellosis. And then typhi that causes typhoid fever and all sorts of stuff as you start going on with salmonella. There's so many kinds, it's just ridiculous. So what are the differences between the bacterial chromosome and a plasmid? That one was stuck there in the middle of everything. We'll go over this. Uh, bacterial chromosome is going to be a large circular DNA that has the actual genome is necessary for that bacteria. Whereas the plasmid is small circular DNA that is not necessarily uh, necessary for the cell, but can be helpful, have genes that are 